Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm Peter Haas. I'm the chair of the Department of Religious Studies here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, as many of you know, we are having, the university is having a year-long uh, series of programs on Charles Darwin, and it is our uh, honor and privilege as the Department of Religious Studies to be sponsoring this particular uh, presentation this afternoon. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you all here and say how delighted we are to see you. I will now turn over the podium to Patricia Princehouse, who will in introduce the program. We are very happy today to have with us uh, two folks that played uh, very interesting roles in the Dover trial, uh, Richard Katsky and Lori Lebo. Uh, the first speaker will be Richard Katsky, followed by Lori. Uh, Richard is uh, Associate Legal Director for the Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which is a watchdog organization that protects religious freedom in America. Um, Lori is, uh, was the uh, primary local reporter covering the trial for the York Dale Daily Record, uh, and also has a book which is for sale in the lobby there, uh, The Devil in Dover. Uh, very interesting book, yes, <laughs> he's holding it up there. Um, uh, real interesting people. I also say that we have some forms here for an event tomorrow that Richard will be speaking at that's an Americans United and Center for Inquiry event um, in Independence at the Sheraton. So uh, without further ado, uh, Richard Katsky. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the uh, department and to Patricia. Um, and I'm, it's really a, a, a great pleasure to be able to be here and celebrate and take part in the, the celebration of Darwin for the year that the university is having. Um, our topic is The Devil in Dover and Elsewhere. And of course, The Devil in Dover is Lori's wonderful book. Uh, so my job is to talk about the and elsewhere part. And so what I'm going to do is give you just a little bit of a taste of uh, what went on in the Dover case to kind of set things up. And then I'm going to tell you about a couple other cases that I've done that actually have nothing to do, well, nothing on the surface to do with creationism and the same issue that, uh, and the issue that maybe you've come here to talk about, but will, I hope, give you a little bit of the flavor of, of what at bottom these controversies are about and, and why I think that the separation of church and state matters and that it's important to protect religious freedom. Uh, but as I said, I, I do want to start with Dover. Uh, Do and Lori will tell you a lot more about the Dover community, I suspect, but Dover is a little town about 30 miles from Harrisburg in central Pennsylvania. In the uh, summer of 2004, the, the science teachers at Dover High School decided that uh, it was time that they really needed new science textbooks. So they went to the school board and they asked the board to buy that book, uh, Prentice Hall's Biology uh, by uh, Ken Miller and Joe Levine. Now this is the uh, most widely used high school uh, biology textbook in the country. About 35% of all high school students in the United States use it for their biology classes. But it happened that the members of the school board in Dover didn't like this book. Now, as the head of the uh, curriculum committee put it, this is a fellow named William Buckingham, whom I'm going, to, I'm going to be saying a little bit more about. Mr. Buckingham said, this book is no good because it's laced with Darwinism. Now, the board members decided that the, that the students in Dover should be taught creationism, and they didn't, want it, they didn't want any book that didn't teach that to be in the science classes. So when it came time in the summer of 2004 for the board members to, dis to explain in public school board meetings why they weren't willing to buy that book and make sure that there were new textbooks for the students in the fall, uh, Mr. Buckingham, at, as chair of the curriculum committee and the person who makes the initial choices about what can be used in the school, said to the assembled crowd of the, the parents and the students and the teachers and the members of the community who were all there, it's inexcusable to teach from a book that says man descended from apes and monkeys. And then he looked down on the crowd and he said, I challenge you to trace your roots to the monkey you came from. He explained, this country isn't founded on Muslim beliefs or evolution. It was founded on Christianity and our children should be taught as such. And he made a sort of a challenge. He said, 2,000 years ago, someone died on a cross. Can't someone take a stand for him? 
And that's, that's the stand the school board members decided to take. They were determined to find a way to get creationism into, uh, into the public school science curriculum in Dover. And so they talked to some lawyers from a religious or faith-based law firm in Michigan. And the idea that they came up with was to adopt a change to the biology curriculum requiring students uh, to be told that there are gaps in problems in Darwin's theory of evolution and to, and, and to require that students be introduced to other theories, it said, including this thing, intelligent design. And then par as part of that curriculum change, the board directed the students to that book of Pandas and People, which is an intelligent design textbook. Now, at the trial in Dover, um, our job was to show that intelligent design isn't science, it's religion, uh, and therefore it's illegal to teach in the public schools. And one of the ways that we did that was we looked at pandas. And we looked at the definition of intelligent design that pandas gives, and it's this. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks, and wings, etc. Now, Pandas was originally published in 1989. Uh, it had that same definition, but we had heard a rumor. Actually, one of the scientists from the National Center for Science Education who was working with us had heard rumors that all through about the previous 10 years, all through the 1980s, there have been manuscripts of this book floating around. And he said, you know, it might be kind of cool to see what those old drafts looked like. So we went to the court. Uh, some of you were here yesterday and heard Judge Jones speak, the judge in the Dover case. So we went to the judge and we asked for a subpoena to go to the publisher and get the, the old manuscripts that led up to the publication of Pandas. And when we did, we looked at this definition and we found something kind of interesting. The definition was almost the same in those early, earlier drafts, but with just some very minor differences. Creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator, and so on. So then we went through and we actually counted all of the uses of creationism and intelligent design in, in those drafts, in all the drafts that we received, and we found something even more interesting. For the first several drafts, the book, talks of, the, the book talked about creationism, creation, God the creator, and the words intelligent design, they weren't there anywhere. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. The word creationism got written out of the book, and the, the phrase intelligent design took over. Now, you may be wondering what happened right there. That's 1987. It's actually about June of 1987. That's when the Supreme Court of the United States decided a, ca decided a case called Edwards against Aguillard and held that it's unlawful to teach creationism in the public schools because it's a religious view uh, and, the, and the public schools aren't supposed to be teaching religion. And it did, doesn't matter if you dress up the religious view to look like science, it's still religion, it's still inappropriate to teach. So the editors uh, of Pandas went through and effectively did a quick search and replace and intelligent design was born. Now, intelligent design is really the claim that some things in nature look so amazingly complicated that we just don't believe they could have come about through natural selection, uh, Darwinian evolution, so, or any other natural process, by the way, anything known or unknown. No matter what science might tell us about the power of evolution or, uh, or, or what scientific discoveries there might be about maybe some other mechanism for life to arise, science is never going to answer this question. Um, we know that these complicated things in nature um, had to have been the product of divine intervention. Let me show you, though, how the leaders of the intelligent design movement describe things for themselves. Philip Johnson is a retired criminal law professor at uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And he's generally thought of as, as the grandfather or sometimes the godfather of the intelligent design movement. He's the one who came up with the idea for it. And what he says is, intelligent design means that God is objectively real as creator and recorded in the biological evidence. William Dembski is the principal intellectual associated with the intelligent design movement. He's a mathematician and a philosopher and a theologian. And here's what he says. 
intelligent design is just the logos theology of John's gospel restated in the in idiom of information theory. Now information theory is a form of applied mathematics. Um, if you don't have your, your pocket copy of the Bible along with you, the logos theology of John's gospel is, is, the, is chapter one, verse one of the book of John in the New Testament. What it says is, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. The word was God, excuse me. That's John's uh, retelling of the creation story. Finally, Michael Behe is a biochemist at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania and is the scientist who is associated with and kind of at the head of the forefront of the intelligent design movement. What he said is, the argument for intelligent design is less plausible to those for whom God's existence is in question and is much less plausible for those to, who deny God's existence. In other words, whether or not you accept intelligent design doesn't depend on scientific research or testing or falsifiability or acceptance in the scientific community or any of that other stuff. Uh, it turns on what your religious beliefs are. Now, as, you're, as I think you'll hear more about later t uh, in our talks today, um, Judge Jones, uh, the judge who spoke yesterday and was the judge in the case, found that intelligent design isn't science, it's religion, um, and because accepting it requires that leap of faith that Michael Behe talks about. And so, because it isn't constitutional to teach religion, creationism in schools, it isn't constitutional to teach intelligent design either. Our public schools aren't supposed to be Sunday schools. Science class is supposed to be for learning science. It's, it's supposed to be parents' right to decide what their children learn about religion, what religious education they receive, and that's why we say religion shouldn't be in the public schools. Now, of course, creationism isn't the only threat to the separation of church and state and the religious freedom that it safeguards for all of us. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you about a, just a couple other cases. Let me tell you about one I've got going on right now. Marcus Borden is the head football coach at the East Brunswick High School in East Brunswick, New Jersey, and he's been in that position for the past 25 years. Now, for the first 23 of those years, he had formal football team prayer. And he had two kinds of prayers. One of them was that in the locker room before games, the players suit up and he has them take a knee and get in kind of a semicircle around him as he stands at the chalkboard behind him. And he goes through and he gives them last minute strategy uh, and gets them re up ready for the game. And then he stops and he gets down, he takes a knee with the team and he clasps his hands and he bows his head and he, and he says a prayer on behalf of the team. And the team members, who were already down on their knee, cross their hand, uh, fold their hands and bow their heads along with him. And Coach Borden did something else too. Uh, high school football games are uh, held on Friday evenings and what East Brunswick High School does on Friday afternoons is it has a team dinner at three o'clock in the school cafeteria where all the players are required to show up for a meal and what Coach Borden would do is, at the start of these meals, he would stand up, tell everybody to stand, um, and bow their heads, and then uh, for the first game of the season, he would uh, say a grace before the meal, uh, and for every other game throughout the season, he would appoint one of the seniors on the football squad to come in and, and, and lead the prayer. And again, he'd tell everybody to stand up for the prayer, and they'd, and they'd bow their heads, and the student would say the prayer, and then they'd get on with the rest of business. Then a funny thing happened. In 2004, the football team started inviting the cheerleaders to, the, to these team dinners. And it happened that one of the cheerleaders had taken constitutional law as her social studies class at East Brunswick High School. And she saw what was going on here and she thought, I don't think this could be right. We learned that you're not supposed to have teachers leading prayers in school. So she went and she talked to her constitutional law teacher and he said, no, you're right about that. That isn't supposed to happen. She told her parents who turned around and called the superintendent of schools. And then another cheerleader's parent called the superintendent of schools and made the same complaint. And then a third parent called. This parent was, was absolutely in tears. She called the superintendent and she said, my son is on the football team and Coach Borden goes through and appoints 
a student to be the prayer giver uh, in rotation. My son knows that his turn is going to be coming and he's not comfortable with that. And so I said to him, why don't you say, the parents said, why don't you say you're not comfortable with doing it, you don't want to be the prayer giver? And, and she said to the superintendent, my son told me, mom, you just don't get it, I want to play football. The point, of course, was that the student knew when you're on the team, your job is to do what the coach says and what the coach wants. Well, the superintendent obviously thought there was a bit of a problem here. She called Marcus Borden into her office and she said, look, students have the right to pray when and where and how they please, and we don't ever interfere with that. But we as teachers and coaches and school officials we don't lead it, we don't sponsor it, we don't participate in it. That, that's not our job, it's not appropriate, I want you to stop. Coach Borden didn't like that very much. This was a Friday, it was a game day, and he just didn't show up at the game that night. Nobody knew where he was. The, the team was there, the other team was there, the, the fans were in the stands. Coach, nowhere to be found. And. Uh, the principal tried to call him, and the athletic director tried to call him, the superintendent tried to call him, wouldn't answer his phone. They didn't know what happened. The kids had to play without their coach. And the next morning, the superintendent and the athletic director found emails from Coach Borden resigning as the coach, saying, I'm not willing to coach the team without prayer. But then Coach Borden talked to a lawyer and got a better idea. He had his lawyer send a letter to the school district saying, I rescind my resignation. Never mind, I'm not really, dis I'm not really resigning. I'm going to stay on as coach so that I can sue the school district. Because after all, his lawyer came to the probably reasonable conclusion that it tells a better story to say, I'm the coach who's not allowed to pray with my students than it is to say, I'm the coach who quit in a fit of pique and now is suing to, to get mine from the school district. Well, soon, as soon as the season ended, Borden filed that lawsuit, and then he did something else. The next spring, he, <clears throat> excuse me, the next spring, he got the uh, team together uh, oh, excuse me. Actually, I want to show you something first, by the way. Borden said, um, from now on, he said in his lawsuit, I think I have a right to, uh, to lead the kids in prayer and appoint the prayer givers, but from now on, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'll, I'll let them do it. They'll be the ones to choose who among them gives the prayers, and they'll be the ones to decide that they're going to have prayers. And all I'm going to do is bow and kneel, uh, take a knee, he said, when they give their prayers, uh, because anything less would be showing disrespect for them for their religious choices. And as I said, I want to show you what that looks like. Um, this was a picture taken with Borden with this new system. That's him up in front in the green uh, shirt there. Uh, so what he would do at that point was, He'd stand at the chalkboard get with, the, with the players around, taking a knee, uh, clustered around him, give them their final strategy, and then he'd stop and he'd say, it's time for the prayer, and he'd get down on his knee and fold his hands and bow his head, and then one of the students would give the prayer. This, this, this was the new routine. A and as I said, after Borden filed suit, he did something else that was kind of interesting. He said the following spring to the student captains of the football team, I want you to go around to, to every player on the team individually and ask them, do you want to continue having prayers? And I want you to report back to me what each of them said. Now if you don't know, student captains on a football team, there's usually one from the offensive squad and one from the defensive squad, and they're appointed by the coach. Uh, they're the kids that the coach thinks can be good leaders of the team, the other students will follow them, will kind of keep in line, and they're also the ones that the coach thinks are going to be loyal to him and help him manage things. So sure enough, the student captains went out and they started asking the other players, uh, do you want to have the prayers? Turns out that they weren't quite quick enough, though, for Coach Borden. So he, so he sends him a, a message saying, my lawyer, just about two days later, my lawyer, my lawyer keeps asking me for the results of your, your contact with the other players. He's trying to set up a trial date and he needs this information right away. You guys have to touch base with everyone by Monday so that I can fax him your email. So the captains snapped to attention, reached the final players, and reported back, 
We talked to all the players you asked about, and everybody agreed that we'd like to continue our pregame prayer ri ritual. That's even the one whose mother called the superintendent in tears. Hope this helps you out, and sorry it took so long. In his suit, Borden claimed that he had free speech and academic freedom rights to coach and to use team prayer as part of his coaching however, however he pleases. And the superintendent and school board couldn't say anything to stop it. And it didn't matter how many parent, uh, parent complaints or student complaints he got. Uh, he has a constitutional right, he said, to coach his team as he pleases and to use prayer as he wants. He also said something else that I thought was kind of interesting. He argued that prayer is a necessary part of football. He said, a team is like a family. If you can't get on your knees and bow your head and, and pray together, you can't be a family. And if you can't be a family, you can't be a team. Now, what's a student supposed to do knowing how the, that the coach feels that way? Not be a team player? Not, not join with what everybody else is doing and what the codex, coach expects? It was obvious to the students that you have to pray if you want to play. Well, initially, uh, the federal district court in New Jersey ruled in Borden's favor and, and found actually that taking a knee in football isn't religious at all. Um, you, you get down on your knee and you bow your head for prayer. That's not religion. That's football. It's just the culture of football, so it's OK. The school district decided to appeal that decision and, and brought me in to, and Americans United in to represent them in the appeal to the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, which has jurisdiction over uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Delaware. And the reason that they did that is that the school board and the superintendent thought that students in their school shouldn't have to face this kind of religious pressure. The school board and the superintendent also knew something else, though. And it was something I didn't tell you before. Uh, it was about, it, and it was about how there was a controversy that over over the football prayer that was absolutely dividing, tearing apart the school community. When Borden resigned for those couple of days before he rescinded his resignation, um, word got out that some cheerleaders had complained, and that was what caused uh, that was what caused the coach to 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 quit. And. There happened to be two Jewish girls on the cheerleading squad. So some of the students assumed, who could possibly have complained about the prayer has to be the two Jewish kids, right? The school district has a, uh, has a computer bulletin board where students can have discussion threads about whatever's going on in school. And so an enterprising student set up a thread on there called Jewish cheerleaders who suck. Now, the emails I, I'm, I'm going to put up, the, the email or the postings rather I'm going to put up, uh, they, they, you'll think that I've censored them uh, because of some sorts of creative spellings and things. That's actually the students' clever ways of getting around the filter on the school system that pre prevents them from using dirty words. Uh, I'm not going to read them out in whole. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of summarize a few if you can't see. But the first one names the two Jewish girls on the cheerleading squad and says, you guys thought you didn't have friends to begin with. Now you're really, well, you can read that yourself. Um, I'll make sure that I make the rest of the year a living hell for both of you. And then another student chimes in and, uh, and threatens to do some damage to, to one, uh, the house and the car of one of them. And then another student comes in. The Jew is wrong. Borden is right. Let us pray. Let's have a rumble. Jews versus Christians. Again, I'll let you read the next one yourself. And it got worse. First they crucify Jesus, then they get bored and fired. What the hell? Jews got to stop ruin, uh, got to learn to stop ruining everything cool. And maybe if that's Borden, if if Borden held a gun to the Jews' head and was like, "Get on your knees and pray to Jesus," then that might be breaking the law. Eh, maybe not. The moral of this this is. Just suck it up if you don't like what's going on in America and go back to your own country and stay there and pray. And the cheerleaders weren't even supposed to be there. If you have a problem with something when you're not even wanted, well, then get out. Damn Jews. Then you wonder why Hitler what he did what he did back in the day. 
and one of the students actually signed in at, with a pseudonym of Adolf Hitler. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, of course, oh, by the way, I should say, there were hundreds and hundreds of these postings. This is just a little sample. Um, even the attempts at what, I don't know, I guess maybe was reconciliation, uh, don't strike me as anything to be all that proud of. Uh, this is getting out of control. Can't we just get back to the old days talking about the real problem in the world, black people? Well, the school district obviously knew that it had a problem here. Because what Borden was doing and the controversy that he was creating was really toxic to the school community. So the school, superintendent and the school board figured that, look, in high school, it's hard enough to try to fit in uh, without having to worry that you're an oddball and you're an outsider and you're going to get attacked just because you don't have the same religion as most of the other kids or as that favorite teacher or coach. Now, in the end, the, the, the federal court, the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, decided in favor of the school board um, and held that not only did the school district have the right to stop what Borden was doing, again, students having the right to pray when and where and how they please, but the school could tell Borden he couldn't do it. The court said that the school district actually had the obligation to do that too. It had a constitutional duty to do so. But our friend Borden, he's nothing if not determined. Maybe that's how you get to be a football coach. I don't know. But he's now asking the Supreme Court to hear his case. Uh, and uh, we'll have to wait to see whether the Supreme Court does that or not. But he's asking the Supreme Court to come in and say that he should be allowed to have those prayers no matter what it does to the school community. Now I want to tell you just one other quick story. Uh, and, that's, and that's this. This is Sergeant Patrick Stewart in the US Army on his way to work. He, uh, a, as a flight engineer on Chinook helicopters in combat in Afghanistan. This is actually Patrick Stewart on his way home. His helicopter was shot down after dropping off a unit of ground troops in, in, a, in a zone with active combat going on. The, the flight crew of four decided to hover uh, over, the, over the landing zone and draw the enemy fire so that those folks on the ground could get to safety. They knew they were giving their lives when they did that, and all four of them perished. This is Roberta Stewart. She's Patrick's wife. Now, she's standing in front of uh, what's called the Wall of Heroes. It's a memorial wall at the Veterans Cemetery in Fernley, Nevada, where Patrick and Roberta and, and their daughter lived. The plaque on the, you see on the bottom there in memory of John Michael Flynn, he was, the, he was the pilot on the helicopter uh, who died alongside Patrick. And you may notice, if you can see it, there's a little cross on that plaque. That's because John Flynn was Christian, and his wife wanted to honor that fact on his memorial, just the way that people do on, on tombstones and memorials in cemeteries all over the world. The blank spot there, though, that's where Patrick's plaque is supposed to go. You see, the Department of Veterans Affairs of the US government, that's the VA, provides grave markers and memorials, uh, memorial plaques to families of members of the armed forces or veterans uh, when they die. And the families get to choose a religious symbol to go on those memorial markers, ju again, just the way you would in a regular civil ceremony. So the Department of Veterans Affairs has a list. And it's got 38 approved religious emblems. 17 of them are versions of a cross representing different Christian denominations. There's a Star of David for Jews. There's a Buddhist Wheel of Righteousness, two Muslim emblems. There's even a symbol for atheists. What there wasn't was the pentacle, which is a symbol of the Wiccan faith. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the Wiccan faith is uh, based on kind of pre-Christian or pagan nature worship. It's, uh, it's a sort of a small religious uh, denomination, but uh, according to a recent survey, is, is the fastest growing in the United States. Now, it happens that Patrick and Roberta Stewart uh, were Wiccan. They were married in a Wiccan hand fasting ceremony, and their faith was extremely important to them. As a matter of fact, Patrick chose to take that pledge that military people do to protect and defend the Constitution and chose to fight and die for his country because it's, it's our Constitution that was protecting 
his family's right to practice their faith and to do it without, without oppression. So Roberta, his widow, wanted to have the memorial to him bear the pentacle, just like the captain, the guy who was, who was killed alongside him, has a cross on his memorial plaque. But the VA wouldn't allow that. For more than nine years, the families of Wiccan dead had been trying to get the VA to add the pentacle to that list, uh, but the VA just refused. Now, why is that? Well, every story about a hero needs a villain, right? Remember this guy? This guy was governor of Texas and was running for president in, uh, in the summer of 1999 when a funny thing happened. There was an article in the Austin newspaper about, uh, about Fort Hood, which is a big military base in Texas. And the article said that uh, the commanding officer there uh, was allowing a, a group of Wiccan soldiers to practice their faith the same way that people of all, uh, all sorts of other religions are allowed to do so on the military base. And this guy, George Bush, was on Good Morning America while he was on the campaign trail and he got asked about this. And he said, what do you think of that? And he said, I don't think witchcraft is a re religion and I wish the military would take another look at this and decide against it. Religious freedom, it's okay for Christians and Jews but not for anybody else. Well, the uh, as it happens, the governor, uh, uh, excuse me, it, that left uh, Roberta Stewart to mourn a blank spot on the wall. That's her kneeling there with, uh, with uh, her clergy member, uh, the Reverend Selena Fox. Now, the governor of Nevada had a different view than George Bush had. He thought that if you fight and die for your country, you deserve to get treated at least as well as anybody else. So he went out and he had this plaque made. It's a fake, actually. It's made to look just like the ones that go on that wall, but it's not given by the VA. It's, it, was, it was done by the governor of Nevada, and he went out there and he put that up on the wall, and he told the local unit of the National Guard, I want you to defend this and make sure that the VA doesn't take it down. Now that's wonderful, don't get me wrong. It was a wonderful thing to do, and Roberta thought so, but she also thought it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough because Patrick and all the other Wiccans and everybody else who fought and, and died for their country deserved better. Just because she got hers doesn't mean that she felt she could give up the fight for, for everybody else. So, so she came to us at Americans United and we brought suit on behalf of her and, uh, and her, uh, her house of worship, the Circle Sanctuary. And in the end, after altogether nine years of Wiccans, Wiccan families waiting and more than a half a year of litigation and something like $250,000 of attorney time and expenses and all that, that that we put in, we finally got the federal government to show Patrick Stewart and all the other Wiccans the same basic respect that everybody else gets. And in the year since that happened, there are now, uh, so far, 27 different uh, uh, different grave markers for Wiccans uh, going all the way back to uh, somebody who died in World War II. But you know what? There are other applications for emblems pending too by some other religious groups that may not be so, so popular either. And the VA isn't acting on those. And so those families have to wait and wait and wait. Controversies over church-state separation often get dismissed as little things, not worth standing up for. People who complain get asked, why do you want to be a troublemaker? What's so bad about this? What's a little prayer in the locker room before the big game? What if there's no pentacle to put on tombstones? There probably aren't that many people who care anyway. Big deal if kids hear a little commercial for intelligent design in science class. It's just a small thing. But these battles really are about what's most fundamental to us what we care about most as individuals. Because after all, encroachments on church-state separation hurt religious minorities, and they do something else too. They divide us along religious lines and ultimately make us, I think, a less decent society. I want to finish by returning just briefly to the Dover case. Now, I'm going to show you a letter to the editor of a local paper by a guy named Michael Freet. 
He's a member of the community who supported the intelligent design policy of the school district. And what he said was, I applaud the Dover Area School Board in backing intelligent design. Seems some people want to take God out of everything. It's high time to put God back in our lives and inform others of what he has to offer. Try God. If you don't like him, Satan will gladly take you back. Now, Mr. Freet clearly thinks that he's got the right religious view and that anybody else who doesn't share that is going to hell. You know what? He's allowed to have that view. He's allowed to voice it. He's a private citizen. But it's a very different story when the government gets behind Mr. Freet or people like him and says, yeah, we're going to enforce this. And that's true whether the government comes in the form of the president or the governor or the local school board or the, the football coach at the high school or anything else. I want you to compare what Mr. Freet had to say with what one of the parents I represented in the Dover case had to say. Now, Cindy Sneath never thought of herself as the standard bearer for any cause. She never imagined that she'd be somebody at the center of a national firestorm. She never sought the spotlight. She and her husband run a small appliance repair business in Dover, and at the time of the case, her son Griffin was about seven years old and in the Dover schools. Griffin is an amazing kid. He's one of these kids who just has this thirst to learn about science. He's fascinated by dinosaurs and the stars and magnetism and all the things uh, about how the world works. He's the sort of kid with that thirst who can grow up to be a medical researcher and cure a disease and save countless lives, or to find a renewable source of energy that'll carry us through to the 21st century. Who knows what Griffin can do? Well, Cindy thinks that that ought to be encouraged, that, that Griffin's quest to understand the world and to understand science ought to be fostered and not squelched. So when she was asked at trial, why do you want to be a troublemaker and complain about this? Here, here's, here's what she said. Well, you know, as a parent, you want to be proactive in your child's education. I mean, obviously, I'm not an educator. I have no big degrees. I want to be proactive, but I depend on the school district to provide the fundamentals, and I consider evolution to be a fundamental of science. And in my mind, intelligent designer, I mean, the word designer is a synonym for creator. And you know, that takes a leap of faith for me. And I think it's my privilege to guide my children in matters of faith, not a science teacher, not an administrator, and not the Dover Area School Board. That last sentence, that ultimately is what all disputes about the separation of church and state are about. Now, I have a special treat for you. Cindy is here today. She doesn't know, oh, she's hiding behind her hand. She doesn't know that I was going to call on her. Um, but Cindy, do you mind just standing up? Let, pe let people see you just for a second. I'm sorry. Incursions on the separation of church and state really make us all poorer. What protects our religious freedom is when courageous people like Cindy are willing to stand up in the face of those violations and say, that's not who we are as a people. It's not what we stand for as a country. It's not tolerable, and I won't tolerate it. Well, sometimes there isn't a Cindy Sneath down the street. The person who has to stand up is you. Thank you. That was wonderful. And uh, equally wonderful, we have Lori Lebo, who will also offer some personal uh, visions of uh, these sorts of issues, specifically about Dover, I think, but perhaps even uh, beyond. Uh, Lori. Um, Richard has me uh, half in tears from, from the. Uh, I have a soft spot for people who are willing to stand up, and Roberta Stewart certainly, and Cindy, who I count as a very good friend of mine now since the trial ended. Um, so I'm going to start out a little emotional, I guess. <laughs> All right. So am I speaking loud enough? No. Okay. Do I? I'm just. I need to project on my own here. Okay. How about this? Any better? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, four years ago. 
it was four years ago, that Bill Buckingham, met the member of the Dover School Board, uttered the, that sentence at a public meeting that touched off a firestorm of debate in his small community and across the nation. 2,000 years ago, someone died on the cross. Won't somebody stand up for him? Buckingham told this to the head of his science, de science department before a crowd of 100 people. Two local reporters, Joe Maldonado and Heidi Bernhard Bubb, dutifully recorded his remarks in the next day's newspaper, as well as the creationist remarks of Buckingham's fellow board members. That a little more than six months later, Buckingham and his fellow board members would deny under oath that he had made the statement at the meeting or that any of them had even so much as uttered the word creationism only sealed their fate for what would come to pass. Seeking an injunction, attorneys representing the 11 parents who had filed suit against the district were taking depositions in order to get board members obvious religious motivations into the court record to prevent the reading of a statement to students that included the phrase intelligent design. Now, if board members had at this time admitted that they spoke of creationism before that crowd of 100 people, if they had not destroyed the audio tapes of that meeting, if they had been honest about their remarks, Dover would have been merely one of the many blips on the radar screen that year for church and state watchdogs. But the hubris of the Dover officials was stunning. Many amazing and dramatic moments related to the case would take place in Dover and across the country, both inside and outside the courtroom. But if not for the board members' disavowal of their remarks that day, it's likely that none of those moments would have happened. The world would have forgotten about Dover, and the school board's attorney, Richard Thompson, who spoke often of his disdain for moral relativism, even as he vowed to lead a revolution in evolution, would have had to search for a test case somewhere else, and I probably would not be standing here in front of you today. But, as you no doubt know, they didn't. Just as Peter did before the cock crowed, those people who professed to be taking a stand for Jesus denied. For months, board members had never contacted editors, nor did they ask for corrections of the newspaper articles. Instead, they slandered the names of two hardworking freelance reporters by accusing them of just making up those quotes. So their remarks and their denial of them divided the community and led to a six-week trial in which intelligent designs into, uh, creationist roots were laid bare. The lead intelligent design expert admitted that for ID to qualify as science, he would have to redefine science to include astrology. The school board would be investigated for perjury, and U.S. Judge Johnny e. Jones, a George Bush appointee, would issue his landmark ruling in December 2005 that said not only was intelligent design not science, but that the writings of leading ID proponents reveal that the designer, postulated by their argument, is the god of Christianity. So instead, it became a beautiful victory for those hold, upholding the First Amendment, scientific principles, and religious freedom. But I'm sure most of you know a lot of this story. So in preparing for this speech, I tried to come up with some ideas that, you know, about things you might not be that familiar with. Mark Twain said 138 years ago, the liberty of the press is called the palladium of freedom, which means in these days, the liberty of being deceived, swindled, and humbugged by the press and paying hugely for this deception. Thomas Jefferson put it, that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Now, as a reporter, I had always been taught that journalists don't get emotionally involved in our subjects. That in the pursuit of objectivity, we are supposed to maintain this air of dispassionate observer. The problem is, I've never really been very good at this dispassionate observer thing. <laughs> as a girl growing up in your county, I went to elementary school with boys who lived back near Dover in a place called Bald Hill and they used to beat me up regularly on the playground because of my big mouth. Today, my husband, who has heard these stories, he looks at me and he shakes his head and he says, you haven't learned a thing. 
While the Dover case has been the most amazing story, it was the hardest one for me emotionally. But unlike the stories I found myself so typically immersed in, it didn't have any of the obvious elements of drama. There were no murders or machetes, no children were beaten to death and in, uh, put into comas, and there was no sex involving barnyard animals, because I'm from York County. <laughs> Instead, it had lengthy discourse on the puffer fish immune system and endless debate over the irreducible complexity of the bacterial flagellum. And Richard, I mean endless debate, right? <laughs> So I've thought a lot about this in the years since the trial ended, and I think the reason that this was such a difficult story for me was it forced me to grapple about issues that have become part of a heated national debate. And I'm not talking about the debate between religion and science. I'm talking about the debate over the role of journalism and the way it is practiced. What is the meaning of objectivity? Years ago, I was sent out on a winter day to cover a routine house fire when, back when I was a reporter, and grumpy at having to leave my nice, toasty office, I stood shivering behind the police tape. When a firefighter, he emerged from the smoke carrying the limp body of this small yellow dog. He was about the size of a loaf of bread. As the newspaper photographer got down on the ground and he was busy snapping away, the firefighter gently rested the dog on the ground, and the paramedics put a, uh, an oxygen mask over its snoot as they worked to revive him. And I'm standing there not knowing whether he's alive or dead, when I have my hands over my mouth. And when the dog awakened, utterly confused, I started jumping up and down cheering. And there was another reporter, and we high-fived each other, and we were all like really excited about this. And for days, the photographer teased me afterwards, saying that I had abandoned my objectivity. Now he was being silly. He knew this because celebrating a small dog's resurrection could hardly be perceived as a breach of journalistic ethics. But it did make me think, where do we draw this line? I can connect emotionally to a dog, but what about parents standing up for their children's religious freedom and First Amendment rights? There's this idea, I'm afraid, that all journalists are biased liberals, and we skew our reporting to reflect badly on conservatives and Christians. Even at times, the media itself buys into this, and we bend over backwards to prove that we are not. In this mad quest for objectivity, fearing that their newspapers, already in their death throes, could be labeled as biased, for instance, publishers in newsrooms across the country this spring told their reporters not to vote as if somehow we are not part of, but above the democratic process. The late great Molly Ivan said, I don't so much mind that newspapers are dying, it's watching them commit suicide that pisses me off. So, as Dover's trial neared that summer, my editor, sounding like a Fox News promo, began to remind me of my obligation to remain fair and balanced about my coverage. I was reminded that I must be careful to present both sides of the issue, that we had to be cautious and not offend those of fundamentalist Christian views. And yet, I already knew by then that it was no accident that the board had plotted to include intelligent design into its biology curriculum during an election year. Following George Bush's victory over John Kerry, evangelicals led by patriot pastors, and as I understand a lot of them here in Ohio, um, and Christian talk radio, they celebrated. And with Congress and the executive branch firmly under their control, they eyed the courts as the next great battlefield in their mission to impose their religious views on this nation. The Dover School Board believed that they had been chosen to lead this fight, foot soldiers in the culture war, to restore America to its rightful place as a Christian nation. And initially, intelligent design supporters speculated enthusiastically that Jones, because of it, Judge Jones, because of his conservative pedigree, was also on their side. On the pro-intelligent design blog, uh, Uncommon Dissent, contributor Dave Scott wrote, quote, unless Judge Jones wants to cut his career off at the knees, he isn't going to rule against the wishes of his political allies. Of course, the ACLU will appeal and this won't be over until it gets to the Supreme Court, but we own that now, too. Of course, the same people who embraced Jones as one of them decried him as an activist judge within minutes of his decision. 
Now, Ann Coulter said about the Dover trial, the Darwinists have saved the secular sanctity of their temples, the public schools. They didn't win on science, persuasion, or the evidence. They won the way liberals always win, by finding a court to hand them everything they want on a silver platter. Now, I think it's fair to say that any honest person who followed the trial knows this couldn't be further from the truth. So if you're a columnist, such as my newspaper's Mike Argento, you got to write things about Ann Coulter like, quote, there is an irony buried deep under the vitriol, idiocy, slander, vileness, ignorance, stupidity, and simply breathtaking inanity that passes for the contribution to the public discourse of an alleged carbon-based life form that goes by the name of Ann Coulter. And if you're Judge Jones, you got to say, as he did in a television interview, she foments a kind of civic stupidity, in my opinion. But if you're a reporter, in the interest of objectivity, do you have to pretend that Ann Coulter makes a valid argument? And are you supposed to use her remarks to balance those of somebody who actually knows what they're talking about? And what about Pat Robertson and his remark following Dover's school board election in which the pro-intelligent design board members were ousted that when disaster strikes, Dover citizens better not turn to God because they voted him out. I'm, and I'm somehow not allowed to have a rational, well thought out opinion that this is utter nonsense. My father, a fundamentalist, speaking in tongues, slain in the spirit, beware the mark of the beast, faith healing Christian, and a man I love dearly, thought Pat Robertson was right. So I felt caught, not knowing where to draw this line of objectivity, trying to be fair to the story at the national level, in my community, and within my own family. But as H.L. Mencken said following the Scopes Monkey Trial, even a superstitious man has certain inalienable rights. He has a right to harbor and indulge his imbecilities as long as he wishes, provided only he does not try to inflict them upon other men by force. He has a right to argue for them as eloquently as he can, in season and out of season. He has a right to teach them to his children. But certainly he has no right to be protected against the free criticism of those who do not hold them. He has no right to demand that they be treated as sacred. He has no right to preach them without challenge. And so I did my best to challenge as a reporter. And the Discovery Institute, which champions intelligent design as a method to, and this is from their own wedge document, launched the overthrow of scientific materialism and its cultural legacies, did its best to deny the fact that when they, when they talk about the intelligent designer, they were, of course, talking about God. Because as you well know, such obvious religious motivations would not pass constitutional muster and would interfere with their long-term goal. So after months of heated interviews, they stopped talking to me during the trial. But one of our first disagreements took place long before that and focused on the simple definition of intelligent design. The Discovery Institute follows fellows recite their definition like a mantra. Intelligent design proposes that some features of the natural world are best explained as the product of an intelligent cause rather than an undirected cause such as natural selection. Any tinkering with the wording in my news stories prompted concerned phone calls and emails of complaint to my editors. Discovery, uh, uh, Discovery's fellows demanded an unquestioning adherence to their carefully crafted definition. So I'd ask them, well, what intelligent cause? It's just an intelligent cause, they'd insist. So I'd make suggestions to clarify the wording. So what about if I wrote, was created by an intelligent designer? No, that was completely unacceptable. Then how about, was designed by an intelligent creator? No. That was even worse. So who's the designer, I'd ask? We don't know. My continued questioning prompted Jonathan West, one of intelligence design's lead proponents and a Mooney instructed by a spiritual leader to go to school to destroy Darwinism, and that's from his, his own interview, told me I was being obtuse. Other reporters don't have a problem with this, he told me and told me. I don't know why this is so hard for you. The problem was that I had trouble with their insistence on the wording, the product of an intelligent cause. 
because as any parent of small children will immediately recognize, such passive voice sentence construction smacks of cover-up. <laughs> because when my sons were young and something would get broken, uh, let's say a cookie jar, and they'd always lapse into the passive voice to sort of hide the identity of the perpetrator, uh, the, they'd say, the cookie jar got broke. And uh, I'd look at them and say, really? Well, who broke the cookie jar? And they'd say, I don't know. And I'd say, could the dog have broken the cookie jar? Maybe, they'd say. Did aliens design the bacterial flagellum? Maybe, they'd say. <laughs> so if all this was true, why was I wrestling with how to present the facts of the story? And why did editors, as one did at one point, tell me to rewrite a story to make it more favorable to the pro-intelligent design side? This on the day that lead attorney Eric Rothschild completely tore about, apart Michael Behe's testimony. And Michael Behe was the lead science expert for the intelligent design side. And that on, this was on the day that Behe was unable to identify the very mechanism of intelligent design and was sim left simply repeating over and over again that we can infer design by the purposeful arrangement of parts. I think the problem is, so is that somewhere along the line, we as journalists have gotten confused over the term objectivity. There's this idea that we're supposed to approach every story as if we have no accumulated knowledge on the subject, as if we are just sponges who soak up information and then wring it back out of ourselves again. But this hardly seems fair to the facts and to the readers. Because if the vast majority of what I observed in court on any, any given day points to the utter vacuousness of intelligent design, and I go back to the newsroom, and in the interest of appearing to be an objective reporter, pick the best quote from the pro-intelligent design side and pick the best quote from the plaintiff's attorney side and present the story as evenly balanced, then I'm basically lying to readers. But the thing is, initially, objectivity wasn't supposed to apply to the, rule, to the journalist. When Walter Lippmann coined it in the 1920s, he was calling for an objectivity of method. Lippmann called on the profession to acquire more of the scientific spirit and that objectivity is the unit of method, unity of method rather than aim, the unity of disciplined experiment. He was suggesting a way of setting aside our biases to get to the truth. He was saying, objectivity is the reporter's version of the scientific method. But in addition to placing the story in the right context, we also have an equally important obligation to explain fairly where the other side is coming from. And that's the tough part, especially when you know one side is lying. And since it's not supposed to be our job to reprint people's lies without qualification, this can be tricky. So near the end of the trial, I had been trying to pull together a piece on why this all played out in Dover. But those defending the school board were no longer speaking to the press. So during a break in the trial one afternoon, I was searching for a neutral subject, and I asked pa Pastor Rowland, who was one of the board members, about this two-hump camel that lived down the road from him. And it opened the door that had been closed between us, and we started chatting. And that Sunday, I attended his church service. And what struck me the most was the difference in his demeanor. Because in the courtroom, he had sat slump-shouldered with his mouth hanging open. He was obviously bored, disengaged from what I found to be fascinating scientific testimony. But in church, he was alive, and he laughed easily. And I remember he grabbed this little boy over his head, and the little boy's laughing, and he's holding him up. And in church, Pastor Rowan was likable. So that day after the service, we sat on the stairs of his church, looking out into a soybean field that had turned gold with autumn. And we talked about what we believe and what we know to be fact. And he talked about how he credits God with keeping his father alive when he had cancer. And while I don't agree with his views on science, at least I understood his need for faith, that there is a purpose to this existence. And so then I tried, and I really tried, to write a story that reflected his faith, but a story balanced with the scientific facts. And that's how I try to be fair. 
Well, anyway, after the trial, I jumped in my car for a two-week road trip of creationist museums across the country because I had gotten completely obsessed about this story. And along the way, I stopped to visit an old professor friend of mine, Greg Bowers, who teaches at the Missouri School of Journalism. And over several glasses of wine, I told him of my struggles to, to uh, tell the story fairly and honestly and of trying to figure out where the line of fair and balanced neutrality ends and being true to the context of the story begins. And Greg told me that he had something to show me, and we got in our car. And he took me down to the campus. Walter Williams, the first dean of the Missouri School of Journalism, wrote the journalist Creed. And one century later, his words remain one of the strongest summations of the guiding principles of our craft, beginning with the simple declarative sentence, I believe in the profession of journalism. And Greg showed me these words dedicated on a bronze plaque outside the college. And I wish I had known of them that night while I argued with my editor who tried to get me to change my story. Because in my inarticulate rambling, I was trying to, uh, trying to convey what it expresses so succinctly. I believe that the public journal is a public trust, that all connected with it are, to the full measure of their responsibility, trustees for the public, that acceptance of a lesser service than the public service is a betrayal of this trust. Williams also wrote, I believe that a journalist should write only what he holds in his heart to be true. And maybe it was the wine, but I thought of what I had witnessed in the courtroom in those past six weeks and spread my arms and hugged the plaque. A writer friend of mine, after he finished Devil in Dover, sent me an email asking me, why do you think the find you found the lies so abhorrent? Because not everybody does. And the lies were something that really bothered me. I think it was because in that deception, they take the best of who we are as Americans. And I think they use their lies to exploit our open-mindedness and tolerance and acceptance to the marketplace of ideas. We as a nation believe everyone's voice carries equal weight. And it's such a beautiful notion. But the Discovery Institute and evangelicals like them take that notion and apply it to their lies. If you don't treat what we're saying as equally valid, then you're discriminating against us. You're being intolerant of our intolerance. Michael Markavage of Repent America once told me that the Anti-Defamation League discriminates against Christians. How? Because the Jews are resisting evangelical efforts to convert them. So anyway, the battle was not over. And few minds were changed by what took place in Dover. Stinging over Judge Jones's decision, the Discovery Institute had been relatively quiet for two years, but this spring, another election year, they returned. As with each constitutional defeat, the movement further dilutes its scientific exertions with vague terms and misleading language in order to make it over the hurdle of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. This time, they're operating under the guise of academic freedom, and lawmakers in states across the country have introduced bills defending a school's right to teach alternative views of evolution. This creationism 3.0, these teach the controversy and academic freedom bills, is essentially creationism distil distilled down to pure nod and wink. By removing such vague concepts like intelligent design, they have nothing to assert beyond the argument that evolution doesn't answer everything, which is the point. By first tearing down evolutionary theory, they can yet then use that doubt that they've instilled in children, yours and mine, as a wedge to drive their narrow-minded interpretation of religion into their minds. Meanwhile, as the academic freedom bills make their way across the country, the Mount Vernon School District School Board is uh, deciding whether to dismiss John Freshwater, a popular science teacher in this area, you probably know about it, who had for, for at least five years allegedly been teaching students that evolution is a lie the assertion that there's a genetic link to homosexuality is wrong because the Bible says it is a sin, said that non-Christians are not saved and are therefore going to hell, and handed out Bibles to the class. In addition to all of this, he's also accused of using an electrostatic device kept in the classroom for experiments to burn a cross into the arm of at least two students. These allegations by witnesses and one of the boy's parents were all backed up by a report of an independent consultant hired by the district to investigate. The boy's parents also filed a lawsuit against the district, but fearing retribution against them, they filed anonymously. 
Now, it may seem terribly strange that those fearing retribution are the parents of the child and not the teacher who burned religious emblems into a student's flesh, but that appears to be the insanity of the situation. At one school board meeting in July, numerous parents and teachers spoke in defense of John Freshwater. One parent told the board, as a Christian, I don't accept the separation of church and state. Now, I've spoken to the mother who filed the suit, and she contacted me after she read my book, and we've had lunch. And she feels intimidated, because unlike the 11 Dover parents, this woman and her husband don't have the support system, as in the Dover case. Attorney Eric Rothschild said in his opening remarks in the Dover trial that there is no such thing as a little constitutional violation. And I suspect he was referring to events such as this. Because if accepted in the name of tolerance, if left unchecked by individuals such as the parents and teachers and scientists and lawyers in Dover who are willing to stand up to religious bullying, such little constitutional violations invariably grow to something much more ugly and dangerous. On the last day of Dover's trial, after it was over, the national media flocked around the parents' attorneys outside the courthouse. And rather than join the media, I wandered out into the street, and I turned around. I was moved, passionately, by what I saw, the fruits of American ideals and reasoned debate playing out on these steps. I had a conversation about this very same subject with jo Judge Jones a year after his decision. Congress had just recently thrown habeas corpus out the window, and I was lamenting the attacks on civil liberties that have taken place in this country. He and I agreed that Dover was most definitely a bright, shiny moment at a really trying time in this nation's history. But Judge Jones told me not to be discouraged. Democracy is messy, he said. It's supposed to be that way. Dover taught us that the democratic process still works when embraced by people, such as Cindy, who believe that you don't just witness your beliefs, that you must put them into practice. And my husband, God bless him, is wrong. I have learned a few things. As Thomas Paine said, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. Thank you. This has been a terrific thing. If I could have you guys come up and uh, we have time for some questions, uh, I think you can probably uh, choose your own. Uh, we don't have the safety of the podium. You, you may. Would you like to a chair up there? No, I'm okay. I'm just kidding. So, yes. Um, I wanted to ask more about the freshwater case. Do with the separate My understanding is that it's all right for a teacher to have religious, personal religious symbols on his or her desk. Actually, uh, the case law on it is that um, teachers aren't generally able to have personal religious items when they're visible to students. Um, and the reason for that, there's a case it's called Roberts against Madigan from a few years ago, where a teacher, among other things, had a Bible out on the corner of his desk and would pick it up during kind of quiet times and read it. The school district, uh, the sc school principal said, uh, you shouldn't be doing that because the kids are getting a message about that. Now, the teacher was doing some other things, too. He was, he was preaching and proselytizing to the students. Um, but the school said, uh, you got to stop that uh, because it's up to the kids to make that decision for themselves, and it's up to their families. And a court said that was right. Um, so, but the difference is kind of a difference between private spaces and what the teacher does. Teachers are people just like everybody else. Um, they have religious freedom just like the rest of us, and that's a good thing. Uh, but when they're functioning as teachers, as state employees, they're held to a different standard. Is that? That's fine. I just I've never heard of the teacher's desk might be a more protected place than the walls of the classroom, so I wanted to hear that. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ron Farmer. I'm the, the secretary of the local American United chapter, and I just kicked myself for not bringing a pile of membership applications here. <laughs> <laughs> you can go very quickly to au.org, and with a few clicks, you can join the secretary. I'm just going to put the website. Oh, great. So, with Delver, uh,
one of the cool things um, that, that came out of that was there, the teachers were timid about teaching evolution because they didn't want to offend you know, students of fundamentalist Christian faith. And uh, so, which is a, is a huge national problem too. I mean, that, that, that probably more so than forcing intelligent design or creationism into school, it's just that they ignore evolution in biology class. But uh, now in Dover, as Brian Ream said after the trial, he said Dover's the safest place to teach evolution in the country. <laughs> and and uh, that it was, um, the teachers revamped the curriculum and now evolution at the beginning of biology is taught, the beginning, because everything follows. Yes. And actually, let me tell you one, one more addendum to that story, which is actually going back to before the case, before the board tried to get, uh, tried to get creationism into the schools and adopted its intel intelligent design policy. Let me tell you what one of the teachers at Dover did, which I think was kind of cool. The way that he would introduce uh, the, the unit on evolution is he'd go up to his chalkboard and he'd draw a line down the middle. And he'd say, on, I, I would have done it over there, but I guess we've got that up. He would say, over here you've got uh, evolution, and over here you've got creation. This is science, that's religion. They sometimes talk about some of the same things, but they do it in different ways, and what we do in here is science, it's over here. I'm not telling you what you should think about what's over there, the religion side. That's a conversation to have at home. Have it with your parents, have it, uh, have it at your church, uh, have that conversation, it's important, but it doesn't go on here. Here we do science. Now when the board put in its policy, this teacher thought, you know what? I can't give that explanation anymore. And why can't I give it anymore? Because I'm now supposed to be teaching what's on this other side here. So how do I tell them what this class is about, what's science and what isn't science? And he felt he couldn't do that anymore. So, so the dark period in Dover was uh, was the period when the school board was, uh, was putting in its policy, when it was trying to advance these ideas, it actually Im impinged on the religious freedom in a whole bunch of ways you might not have thought of for those students. Now the teachers feel more free to teach evolution, as Lori said, it's a glorious thing. Um, the families are now more free to make decisions for themselves what, what their kids should learn about faith too. And, and that's also a happy outcome. Yes. Well, let, let me, I always like to tell a couple of stories so you can get a feel for these things, but what you should know, the first thing is there, there it was the coach who was suing the school district saying, I have this right, you can't tell me to stop. So it was the coach who was in control of things and in the same way that there was a decision, I don't mind what it's doing to the school community because I wanna do this, he made a decision to sue. You always think about those things as a lawyer. Um, you think about what it takes to stand up for somebody's rights, and you know. And there's a problem. What what uh, what Lori told you about the case involving uh, Mr. Freshwater here in Ohio, um, as she said, the parents uh, are are anonymous plaintiffs, and there's good reason for that. It can be really, really dangerous to stand up for your rights. Uh, we uh, two two uh, at least two of the parents in Dover got death threats. Uh, in other cases that we've had in Americans United, uh, the plaintiffs have had death threats, the lawyers have had death threats, uh, we've had bomb threats at the office. Um, there was one case where, uh, if you remember the story of uh, former uh, Chief Justice Roy Moore in Alabama when he put the Big Ten Commandments in the, in the Supreme Court building for the state of Alabama, and we brought the case, we at Americans United brought the case challenging that. Uh, and one of the people who was a plaintiff there complained, her name was on the pleadings, her name was on the court papers, uh, and she had the windows of her car shot out twice. She had the windows of her house shot out twice. She had death threats, her parents had death threats, and when she went to the police to try to get some help, they said, you don't like it, drop your lawsuit. 
Then she went to the Board of Aldermen, the town council, and she said, look, I know we may disagree about the, the case, the issue, the Ten Commandments being there, but can you speak up and just send the message to the community that we don't solve our problems by violence and threats of violence, that's not okay. And what the Board of Aldermen said to her, you don't like it, drop your suit or leave town. You're not wanted here. Of course you think about those things. You think about them every time and lots of people for very good reason decide that they, they can't be the ones to stand up and, and I never, I never, I never think ill of somebody who says, I'm too scared to stand up and complain. Uh, but without that, there's really no one to police the violations. There's nobody to protect all of us. So you have to take on a certain amount of risk and you have to accept the fact that, uh, that these, contro these controversies always divide communities and some, and, and you, real, you get to realize over time that sometimes the trial is the healing process. I think that's what happened in Dover. I think that's what happens in a lot of these cases where, uh, where the community comes together, can come together around a legal understanding and a social understanding. Uh, and, and that's, I guess, the best that you can hope for. Yeah, right after the trial, uh, five days after the trial, there was an election and all the, uh, all, there were eight seats open on the school board and eight of them lost. And it was the eight candidates who opposed intelligent design in school who won. So there was the, demo and they could not appeal then because the democratic process had thwarted their revolution. And actually one of the cool things I think, uh, the, the new school board came in and these were folks who had run saying, we're opposed to this policy, we're gonna make the education in the schools about the education, not about intelligent design, not about religion. But they also said, you know what? We're, we're not going to pull the policy, the intelligent design policy in the school. We're gonna wait and let Judge Jones tell us what's legal and what's illegal. Yeah. Because we think it will be better for the community to get that message than have it be an ongoing political struggle now and next year and the year after. And so they waited and they got that ruling. Uh, and then they said, look, whatever that ruling is, we will accept it. We will live with it, even if we, the board members, don't like it. Uh, and that was part of that healing process because it meant that the community had not just a definitive answer, but an understanding of, of kind of mutual respect. I wonder if Cindy could, would, Cindy, would you be willing yeah. to tell us what you went through trying to decide uh, whether to become oh, a player? Well, it's not an easy decision. My children were younger and they were in elementary school, so it wasn't really a matter of them. You had a question? Yeah, no. I'm sorry. Well, of all of the many disturbing things that you talk about in education, in some ways I think that, well, one of the things that I find particularly disturbing are the emails. Oh. The message board that you, uh, yeah. you shared us. And I'm amazed that it was able, I mean, I don't know how long it went on. I assume the school shut it down at some point. But, I mean, that has I mean, the, the, the attitude to just it's really scary. So it seems to me that there's the sort of the, the public piece of this, right, which are the trials of all that, or, or how it's represented in the press or, or whatever. But then there's, there's these horrible attitudes. And I'm just, I guess maybe it's more common than a question, but I'm just curious if you can follow up on what happened with that. And, well, the first thing is, yes, the school district, this was on the school district's computers, and when, and when the school administrators found out, they took it down. It was about a day and a half. Uh, but in that day and a half, there were hundreds of postings, hundreds of them, like I showed you. And those sentiments don't go away. Those divisions don't go away just because you take down, uh, down that blog. 
uh, it was those same sentiments that drove the, that drove the death threats that the folks, some of the folks in Dover and some of the other people I've, re uh, I've represented have had. The, the, the vitriol is sometimes surprising, uh, but it's commonplace. One thing, if you heard Judge Jones yesterday, he said was that after he issued his decision, he received death threats and he had to have the U.S. Marshal Service have a protective detail for him and for his family. Over Christmas. Over Christmas, uh, because his life was at risk. Battles about religion and government are some of the most pointed, serious, cut closest to home, some of the most painful things that we deal with in society. And they're also some of the things that get the most violent. Um, if you don't mind my getting preachy for just a second, uh, the United States is more religiously diverse today than at any time in our history. It is more religiously diverse than any other country in the world. When you look around the world today, you see uh, examples of, uh, of violence, war, killing, all done uh, when, uh, all done in the name of religion. And yet somehow here, for more than two centuries now, we've managed to avoid most of that in a way that nobody else has. And what I want to do is actually, I want to read you something. I wish that, this is something that I wish I had said, but I didn't. Uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said it in her, uh, in her last opinion before she retired from the Supreme Court uh, on, on, uh, on the Establishment Clause on Religion and Government. And she said it after uh, about uh, two decades of wrestling with questions about the proper relationship between church and state. And she thought about that problem that I, that, that sort of weird puzzle that I just raised, and she said this. At a time when we see around the world the violent consequences of the assumption of religious authority by government, Americans may count themselves fortunate. Our regard for constitutional boundaries has protected us from similar travails while allowing private religious exercise to flourish. Those who would renegotiate the boundaries between church and state must therefore ask a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? Mm.